this is what my world looks like this morning. It's freezing cold and snow is in there in the corner of the yard. Perhaps you can see. Despite everything, it was Happy New Year! Welcome to episode 124 of A Stitch in Time, the first episode of 2020. Today is Wednesday, January 15th. My name is Carol, my Ravelry name is Knits and Pearls, and I am coming to you from my home in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia not too far east of Vancouver, where we are experiencing some very wintry weather. Since I shot that opening footage, a couple of hours have passed, the clouds have all moved right back in, and I think it's starting to snow again. But it's hard to tell. We are experiencing Arctic outflow winds. I think the wind chill this morning was minus 21 degrees Celsius and it's hard to tell if it's snow that's falling from the sky or snow that's just being blown around. In any case, I think the scientific term for this kind of weather is it's freaking cold out there. I hope you've all been well so far this year. I have um, kind of been settling back into normal life after the holiday season and I didn't really have um, a, much to talk about or B, much time to talk to you about things until now. So um, I've had a couple of queries uh, wondering how I am. I assure you I am fine. Thank you so much for your concern. I'm happy to finally get a chance to sit down and talk to you. I have several finished projects. Yay! A couple of works in progress and I'm going to talk to you today about my goals for the upcoming year, in addition to just telling you what's been going on the past couple of weeks in my life. I have made myself uh, some gingerbread tea latte to have on this uh, snowy day, and I thought that was an appropriate cup. Not only is it nice and warm, but it has little snowmen and snowflakes on it. I think it's going to be a long one, so settle on in. Find yourself something um, nice to drink, whether it be hot or cold, depending on where you live. And hopefully, um, if you're looking for a bit of an escape from this crazy world, whether it be wildfires or extreme weather or Iranian missiles or impeachment uh hopefully this will offer you a little respite from all the crazy going on in the world right now i know i could use one all right finished projects um i'll leave the obvious one until last i'm trying to decide what to talk about first i think i will talk about my adventurer scarf because this was finished first out of the three that I have to show you. So this is the adventurer scarf by Amber O'Brien and I knit it over Advent and then into January with my Fiber Nymph Dye Works 2019 Holiday Harmony Mini Collection. So this was the beginning of it and I incorporated all 24 mini skeins, except I subbed in a little bit of a Fiber Nymph Dye Work sock blank in this section here. As you can see, it is a chevron scarf with a diagonal, or with diagonal edges. I would say it turned out to be from its longest point, ooh, well, I'm 5'3", so it's probably mm, six and a half feet long, a really nice length and a really nice width for a scarf. It's long enough to wear the way I like to wear my scarves. Oops, I just saw an end that did not get snipped off. That's okay, I'll do that later. I like to wear a scarf quite often like this. 
Oh, you will hear the uh, furnace kick on, a necessary evil at this time of year. Uh, you may also hear snow shovels out there. I got out nice and early and shoveled uh, the driveway, but our neighbors across the street and beside me have both been working on theirs. So you might hear a scrape of shovels occasionally too. Anyway, I am very, very happy with how this um, scarf turned out. See what a nice length it is. Covers my body, but doesn't go too long. And um, I really do look forward to wearing this. It will go with so many things. Um, it's kind of funny. My camera's acting up right now. And it, while my screen is not gray, it is a very washed out color. So all these beautiful bright colors look extremely um, subdued um, in the screen that I am seeing, but I checked it out with my computer and it seems to be recording okay. It's just uh, not projecting it back to me. I've dropped this poor thing so many times. I'm holding on my uh, viewing screen with scotch tape. Um, it's no wonder I'm having uh, issues with it. I don't really want to spring for a new camera. I am hoping to find somewhere that can uh, repair it for not too um, much money. Because uh, it's not, you know, it's not worth tons and tons. Um, but we don't have any camera shops in town. And the um, place where I bought it would have to send it out and it was going to be very expensive long rambling thing you don't need to know that but I'm hoping to get that back in working order soon um, I'm actually gonna take this scarf off because all of a sudden <laughs> I'm very warm so that does bode well for its uh, comfort level on a cool day without wearing a sweater so I will take it off. I thought I might wear it through the whole podcast, but there's no way. All of a sudden, it feels very warm in here. It's sweater weather, but you know, it's more necessary outside than in. Uh, so, the second finished project I have to share with you are my scrappy advent socks, which I knit out of the leftovers from that scarf. And I love these socks. Look how pretty they are. I love the scarf too. I really want to emphasize that. The colors are really pretty and it's really fun. And these socks, I can't wait to wear them. Uh, my sock blockers end like right there. When I blocked them, I shoved the end of another pair of sock blockers in there in order to keep this fairly straight. So um, here you can see this kind of neon orange and green that is what I substituted in the scarf but I do love it in the in the socks so um, what can I say other than these were knit from the toe up 64 stitches and um, they are much longer than my regular socks which I usually if I do a short row heel which is what I did in these I usually will go eight inches to the top of the short row heel. Um, these I'm not sure exactly how much more they are, but I was concerned about them. Um, sorry, <laughs> the people across the street keep catching my eye. I'm like squirrel, only it's people. Anyway, um, <laughs> I was concerned about these being uh, wide enough as they got closer and closer to where my calf muscle starts to um, get bigger. And so what I did is I think it was about here, the last stripe, I increased by four stitches. And then just before the ribbing, I increased by another four stitches. So the uh, ribbing section is 72 stitches and they fit beautifully. I'm really glad I did that. They would have been too tight going over my calves otherwise. So um, yeah. Uh, not much more to say about uh, these other than I love them and I am so happy with this uh, mini collection and I look forward to doing this again next year. I highly recommend it if it's something you're considering. I've had a number of people say 
how much fun it was to watch me open them over Advent and how much it inspired them to uh, order some Advent yarn themselves. I do, I do highly recommend it. It was such a fun way to lead up to the holidays. And I'm just so pleased too. I've ended up with two really great projects out of the one collection. So um, because these are not uh, specifically Christmas colors, I'm actually going to wear these socks all year round. I thought about saving them until next year Christmas time, but I think um, I'm going to put them into my rotation right away now that I've recorded. I still need to take photos though. Speaking of, my, a, lot, a lot of my project pages are way behind on photos and I will do my best in the next week or two to try and catch up with that. Just have to have really good light, which we have not, and good timing, right? So eventually I will get to that. My um, third finished project I am wearing it is Granito by Hohi Locatelli, and I knit it from Malabrigo Arroyo in the Jupiter colorway. I am going to bring this up close to the camera so you get a really good look at the beautiful colors in this yarn. Um, I enjoyed knitting it up. I have some reservations about the finished project. Um, I'm going to pop in a little recording uh, right now that will show you the entire sweater and give you a little bit more information about it. So I'll be back after that. This is my finished granito. What I like most about this sweater is the yarn. I love the colors. Red is my favorite color anyway, and then this red has so much going on. It has red and crimson and pink and brown and beige, kind of a taupey color. Um, and I'm really happy with the way that by alternating three skeins throughout, I got a good distribution of the lights and darks of the skeins because there were um, some noticeable differences between some of the skeins. I also really love the pockets. I think they are a really fun design feature. What I'm not so crazy about is the finished size. I, well the original pattern, um, well I guess it fits like the pattern is supposed to. You're supposed to have uh, seven to eight inches of positive ease and this gives me about seven and I deliberately knit the second size that would give me about three and a half inches of positive ease but after blocking my sweater has stretched out quite a bit um, because the uh, shoulders are sitting so much lower my sleeves are coming down quite low on my hands and I feel like I have a lot of extra fabric all through the armhole area, which I don't really like. I also feel like I don't need a sweater to make me look, you know, wider than I really am. I don't, I don't mind the idea of a relaxed sweater, but I feel like this just does not really flatter my body whatsoever. So uh, this is superwash yarn. So I did know it would stretch some once it was washed and laid out, which it did. And then I ended up throwing it into the dryer with some damp clothes in the hope that it would return to a more similar size uh, that it was while I was knitting it. And it just hasn't gone that far back. So I have not trimmed any ends off yet, but I am going to give it one more chance before I frog it. I am going to uh, wet it again and either throw it in the dryer right away or let it dry a little bit and then th throw it in the dryer and let it finish drying and I feel like that might snug it up a little more and once I've done that I'll make my final um, decision on whether this is a project that I will keep and wear or whether it is bound for the frog pond. I'd really hate to see it hit the frog pond. It took quite a while to knit actually, 
and the uh, pockets are a real nuisance to sew in. So after all that work, plus I had already knit it all the way once and frogged it back to basically the bust line and re-knit it. And I did that specifically because I was finding it too big and I ended up incorporating some decreases both front and back, basically between the bust line and the pocket. And I can only imagine how wide it would be down here if I had incorporated those decreases. So the sweater's going to get one more chance and then I will make my final decision. All right, so I'll keep you posted on what the outcome of that is. Um, in the meantime, let's move on to works in progress. I only have two at the moment. One is a pair of socks that I cast on, I think around, maybe it was the 30th or so. Um, it's a pair of socks for my husband. I gave him this yarn for Christmas because I didn't have time to knit him socks before Christmas. It is Cascade Heritage Wave in the woodsy colorway and that is color 506. So I have one sock completely done. The Heritage Wave yarn is like a barber pole of, I'm not sure if they're actually, I think there might be two strands that that ply with two more strands of a different color and so you get this um, sort of uh, changing colors as you go along. It's hard to tell, but there actually are a couple of different color changes going on like between here and here, but they are very subtle to say the least. Um, on the other hand, I kind of like how it ended up working out with the heel being um, in the sort of the same color and that made for a good transition over the instep. Sometimes when you have striping or color changing there can be an abrupt line here once you pick up for your um, gusset after working the heel flap. So it's a 72 stitch sock uh, which is typical for what I uh, knit for my husband. Uh, knitting them from the top down with a traditional heel flap and gusset and it fits Perfectly, I'm happy to say. Um, I have got a fair bit done on the cuff of sock number two, and you can see the yarn is again quite different. I actually started from the other end of the ball rather than continuing on with where I left off. Just a no particular reason, just a decision I made. So there's the beginning, and um, there's sort of what's up and coming as far as the uh, colors go. I was hoping I might be able to do something similar. Start with a lighter color and end with a darker. But I didn't have enough yarn that it was going to work out that way. So I didn't even try and manipulate it after that. I just started with what was um, at the other end of the ball. So those are coming along nicely. And then um, this week I also started a pair of socks that I am knitting for one of my curling teammates. I knit her a pair of socks last year with some hand spun that she had bought from a friend and she asked me if I would do the same again. In fact she wants two pairs. So I, um, she gave me the yarn on Thursday when I saw her and she wanted the first pair to be out of the brown yarn that she had. The other is kind of a, a kind of an aqua blue. Um, it's basically, I think, worsted weight, so it knits up very quickly. I am doing what I did for her last time, and that is I'm starting from the toe up. I started with 12 stitches, I increased to 44, and I've done a yarn over after or yarn over short row heel and I'm going to leave them like that get her to try this on make sure it's going to fit because I dropped down a needle size from the socks I made last time and um, if these fit her okay um, 
The reason I did that is her other ones were just a little bit loose. So I'm going to get her to try these on uh, when I see her next, and then I'll continue um, up the uh, leg. So that's what I've been working on for the past couple of weeks. Um, acquisitions. I do have a few. I took advantage of Fiber Nymph Dye Works after Christmas sale and I picked up three skeins of yarn. So uh, the first is the um, Bedazzled Base in Summer Fairy because if you're going to have yarn about fairies of course it has to have sparkle in it. This is a five stripe colorway and I'm really anxious to see that knit up. So that was the first skein. Um, when I was doing, working with the um, uh, holiday mini collection, oh, that's my neighbor. Oh, no, oh, that's just someone driving by with a really noisy truck. Um, while I was working with the uh, minis, I really liked the mountain tweed yarn, and so I picked up a whole skein of it. This is the Red at Night colorway. It's so sad to look in the camera and see this washed out color when I know in real life it is so beautiful, but hopefully it is coming up well for you. It actually goes pretty well with my sweater. Can you tell I like these colors? And then finally, I thought I would try this. I think it's a new base or a trial base for Lisa. It's called Linnaeus. And it is 70% um, superwash merino, 20% uh, yak, and 10% nylon. And it's a fingering weight. Um, this color is variegated. It's called Winter Deep. And I also love the colors in there. I guess, again, kind of complements what I'm wearing. So no surprise there that I would like it. So I am looking forward to um, trying these out. And I'm going to take a little bit of a quick break, go warm up my tea, change out hummingbird feeders, and then I'll come back and talk to you about what's up for 2020. There. <laughs> we have Anna's hummingbirds that stay around our region all year long. And as you might imagine, this extremely cold weather is really hard on them and it makes it quite challenging for us who feed them to keep their uh, feeders thawed throughout the uh, cold weather. Um, if I put out a feeder completely thawed, uh, it's frozen probably within a half hour to 45 minutes. And so I've sort of devised a routine to keep switching them out during the day and then I bring them in at night so they can completely thaw. I'm going to talk about a little bit about that later, but for now, let's talk about 2020. First, I'm going to have a sip of my nice warm tea. One thing with doing a latte with milk, even when it gets cold, it doesn't taste so bad as just plain old cold tea, but I've still been warming this up several times uh, before and um, during recording. Okay, um, so some years I do a lot of planning when it comes to crafting, and other years I hardly do any at all. In 2019, I had quite a long list of things I wanted to accomplish, and it was actually fairly successful. And uh, if you watched last episode, you'll, you'll know what uh, those goals were and how I uh, did or did not achieve them. This year looked like one of those years that was going to be pretty loosey-goosey. But then last night when I was starting to do show notes, I realized there were a few more things that I wanted to do and I actually was inspired to take part in Fiber Nymph Dye Works 20 in 20 challenge. I did not see that coming, I have to say. Uh, so I made out a list of 20 knitting goals for 2020, and I thought I would share them with you. Um, first thing is 
I have two pairs of socks left from the show, or from the Handmade Sock Society 2 by Helen Stewart. One of which I've started and one that I have not. So I do have the Sailing School socks on the go. I started this I think soon after the pattern came out out of some uh, Tannis Fiber Arts yarn. That is in the, let's see, it's her, um, it's, a, it's a fingering, blue label fingering, and in the shadow colorway. There's her label. And I didn't get very far, so there's the yarn again, and I've only done that much on one sock. So basically I have pretty well a full pair of socks to do there. And then uh, after that came out, actually in December, the final pattern for that collection came out. I didn't even download it to my computer back then. Um, but I did that this morning and I printed off just a few pages. Unfortunately, my printer is running out of some ink, so I have a stripey picture to show you. But these are the dorsal socks. You can see it's got like a sort of a tail pattern, like a whale's tail pattern or fishtail pattern going up the back. Um, Anyway, so that's my first two um, goals for 2020. Knit sailing school, finish those off, and knit dorsal. I just realized something I need is over there, and I'll get that in a minute. <laughs> um, actually, I'm going to get it right now because it's the next thing on the list. And near the end of last year, I had a ball knitting the uh, butterfly or papillon shawl by, um, it's not going to be easy to find, I don't think. Give me a second. I should be able to find it in my notes here. Marin Melchior. And I loved it so much that I began a second one using some black yarn as my base color and then incorporating some uh, jewel toned colors in it. Actually goes this way. I see it's falling off the needles, but that's okay because what I decided is I wanted to swap out a couple of the colors. I wanted to put this purple yarn where the blue yarn is and vice versa. And so I am planning to rework this shawl and then obviously finish it uh, for 2020. So I'm kind of looking forward to getting back to it. I loved doing this pattern. It was a lot of fun and I think it's really cool to see it with the um, bright colors, bright jewel tones in contrast with the black. So I think that's going to look really neat. I just realized when I turn my camera back on, I'm actually seeing the color as it should be. Well, that's a good sign. Um, I didn't realize it at first till I just dawned on me. I can actually see what colors these look like. And in fact, I believe the colors that I am seeing in the screen are more true to life than I have uh, previously been able to capture with this camera and with my lighting. So hopefully you get a true idea of what those colors look like this time around. I know that wasn't the case before. So that's two projects uh, that I have uh, in progress that I want to finish, the Sailing School Socks and that. And then, uh, so Dorsal Socks is a new project. And then um, another thing I want to knit, I don't have the pattern to show you. I'll try and remember to put a picture in here. They are the Songbird Mittens by Erica user, not sure how to say her name, H-E-U-S-S-E-R, and I bought yarn for the 
project, I think a couple of years ago, the Swan's Island, or Blacker Swan, excuse me, Blacker Swan, um, Falkland Islands wool, and um, I'm not sure if it has the color name on here or not, Diddle D Red and Pebble. So I, especially when it's been cold, think a, a pair of fingering weight stranded mittens would be a lovely thing to have in my possession. And so I am finally going to get around to knitting those this year. And I don't know if I would have enough left for um, a hat, probably not. But if I did, I would also um, make a hat. But I don't think I will. Uh, another new project I want to do, and this is the thing that I definitely, definitely am getting done this year, is knitting Zweig, Zweig, I don't know how to say it, by Caitlin Hunter. And I had acquired the yarn for this just um, this fall. I had uh, talked to one of the women of Mid Knit Cravings at uh, Knit City. I think it was the end of September and then I placed a special order because they didn't have these colors in stock at the show. So this uh, solid or tonal green is basil and then this yarn which I'll use for the yoke is called pesto and it has, I guess you can see it's got green and a bit of yellow in it. So I think those are going to look really really good together. I am planning, I've been just looking on the computer, and even though this is a fairly loose-fitting sweater, as a lot of Caitlin Hunter sweaters tend to be, I intend to make it um, more shaped. You might be able to hear just the noises from the wind. It occurs to me, I'm so used to it, it's like a constant background noise these days. But um, you might be wondering what that is. No, there's no one on my roof, it's just the wind blowing things around and shaking, shaking them. Another sweater that I um, want to make, and again, I don't have uh, the pattern yet, I will put a picture up here, is The Weekender by Andrea Mowry. And I bought this um, yarn to do that. It is Cascade 20. Cascade 220 Superwash Wave, and I didn't write down the color name. It is just called, it's color 116. I know I have it in show notes from before, but I, I don't know what it is off the top of my head. It is a little bit more teal than it's showing up in this uh, light that I see. Um, the sweater... It's actually a very similar shape to the one I'm wearing, but again, I was looking online and um, a number of people have made it in a size that is uh, closer to their actual measurements and it fits more um, close to the body rather than this wide, you know, loose fitting garment and so that's how I plan to make that one too. And then you might remember I very recently, in fact I maybe I showed this on my last podcast or maybe the one before. I recently visited 88 Stitches in Langley. Um, they had a, a sweet fiber uh, sort of pop-up shop going on there. They do normally carry Sweet Fiber. The owner's daughter is the dyer behind Sweet Fiber. So you can usually get some there, but they had a, a whole whack of it one day, and I went and um, picked some up. So I owned three skeins of this uh, Super Sweet Sock in Driftwood. Um, I've owned it for a while. And then I picked up this set of minis. And while my initial thought was to do a shawl, when I realized that this 
sweaters or that this sweater quantities worth of yarn was the same base as this and that it had would go together I've decided I'm going to do a color work sweater with this and so um, that's another goal for 2020 so that's like one two three sweaters yeah three sweaters all together if you're keeping track um, then um, I have two very vague projects in mind because I have neither yarn nor pattern picked out for them and that is because the inspiration has yet to come to me but I have plans that last year it was my plan to uh, publish at least one paid for or one pay for pattern and I did two this year I want to design at least one sock pattern and at least one shawl pattern so those are two more goals for 2020 and then I'm moving to yarn I have a number of skeins of yarn that I want to uh, knit up first things First, I'll talk about a couple of sort of wintry yarns um, as opposed to Christmassy. So this is one that I also recently acquired. It is Mon Pays Saint Liver from uh, Biscot Yarns, self-striping sock yarn. I really, really want to um, get a pair of socks out of this sooner rather than later. And I was also really excited to uh, acquire this West Yorkshire Spinners Signature 4 Ply in the Christmas Robin colorway uh, late last year. I didn't get a chance to knit it up for Christmas, but uh, Robins are anytime birds, so I plan to also knit this up at some point this year. That's two of the yarns. I have, um, I'm going to reach over here. I have several skeins of yarn that I've received uh, as gifts over the past couple of years and uh, whenever I have really special skeins I tend to put off knitting them waiting for just the right project and sometimes maybe I need to go out and find the right project. So one skein is this beautiful, it's hard to tell in this light, it's red with, with tones of purple in it. This came from a friend of the podcast and um, it is String Theory Keeper Sock and it's in SWK Red and it was dyed especially for a, a yarn shop close to where she lives. So that is going to become something this year or at least that's the plan. And then I think it was, was it last year? I can't remember if it was last year or the year before. And my daughter bought this skein of yarn for me for my birthday from Riverstone Yarns. Um, they are British Columbia yarn. And um, let's see if it's called. Hand painted fingering weight it is a merino cashmere nylon blend, and this is called Contemplation. So that needs to become something beautiful, also. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, just this past Christmas, I received this beautiful skein of yarn from another friend of the podcast. And it's from Zen Yarn Garden, part of their Art Walk series, Mountains and Lake. Two things that hold a special place in my heart, living where I do. And so, again, I look forward to knitting this into something really special. And finally, something that kind of led me to the 20 in 20 challenge is that I had already decided to take part in Fiber Nymph Dye Works um, monthly makes program this year. And that's when you use Fiber Nymph Dye Works yarn to make projects. And um, I believe you can earn 
depending on when you complete items and how many grams you use, you can earn yourself um, a skein of yarn, I think is the, the case. Part of it is that and part of it's just uh, because I already owned some beautiful skeins of Fiber Nymph Dye Works and then I just acquired some more and I decided I need to knit them. And that would be a good incentive. So. I already showed you these three skeins that I had acquired just very recently. And then I'll show you what else I have. Um, I have this skein that I just got that was part of my, um, I don't know why I can't remember, Holiday Harmony collection. So this, I had ordered a full skein of yarn and so this is a five stripe colorway from that and then I have um, it's wine o'clock somewhere definitely a colorway after my heart and then I have bought these as a set um, this is denim and this is chambray can see one is self-striping, one is not. So it might become socks with heels and toes, and then, hmm, socks with heels and toes. Uh, I don't know, never thought of it that way before, but um, they certainly do go together. And chances are I will, at the very least, incorporate some of this for heels and toes for that yarn. And then I have a skein that I have had for a long time. It even has the old label on it. Uh, this is on her Sunshine Base, which is 100% Merino Super Washers, about 490 yards of fingering weight in the Zinnia's colorway. And I just remember seeing this um, on her podcast and immediately falling in love with it. And um, at one time, I had in mind to knit a shawl called Zinnia. But uh, when I went to buy the pattern, I found out it was no longer available. And so, um, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Uh, a shawl of some sort. So, um, that one really needs to get knit because I've just had it so for so long. It's time it got some love. So I believe, looking around me, that that is the end of my 20 in 20 list. Uh, today's the closing date for actually uh, compiling your list for the first quarter. And then every quarter you have a chance to go in and revise the list, which is great because honestly, as much as I say this is what I want to do in 2020, I know myself well enough to know that as new, ooh, shiny things come along, that definitely might impact uh, my decision on what to knit this year. What I like about the choosing yarns as opposed to um, actual patterns and projects is that there is more choice involved when it comes down to, you know, knitting with a particular yarn. I don't have to lock myself into a particular pattern. And the patterns that I have locked into, I already have the yarn for. So they have been uh, chosen before now. So that's it for uh, what's coming up in 2020. By the way, if you have any particular uh, knitting or crafting plans for 2020, I would love to hear about them. So pop by the Ravelry group and uh, maybe comment in this episode thread or in the chatter thread. I'd love to hear what you're up to. Um, so I haven't included a what I'm reading sec segment for the last few podcasts, but I have actually been reading a fair bit. Uh, lately, so I uh, finished up Prairie Fires by Carolyn Fraser, and that was a biography of uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, and I enjoyed that book immensely. I learned a lot of things I didn't know before, and definitely got an insight into her character and writing and what um, might have influenced it in various ways. So I'd highly recommend that book if you're at all interested in learning more about uh, 
about Laura Ingalls Wilder, the author of the Little House on the Prairie series. Um, I was thrilled to discover just before Christmas that Louise Penny had a new uh, book out in her Inspector Gamash series. And um, so it is called A Better Man. And immediately after Christmas, my husband had received uh, some Amazon gift cards and he downloaded it for Kindle right away. And uh, since our we have uh, one account for the two of us. I got to read it on my Kindle right away too. Uh, it's they're always a good read. This was no different. Um, and then I had, I believe maybe I had got an audiobook I hadn't listened to before. You've heard me talk about Reese Bowen. She has the Royal Spinous Mysteries that I've read, and also. Um, Oh, I can't think of the um, woman's name. Molly. Molly, someone. It's a. It's also a mystery series. That one is set in uh, sort of turn of the century New York. Uh, turn of the twentieth century, <laughs> and um, so recently, uh, she has started writing some books set in in around um, World War Two. So I read the first one in Farley Field. I just finished it, I think, a couple of days ago, yesterday or the day before. And it turned out to be a, kind of a mystery also, but not in the same campy writing as the um, Royal Spinous mysteries are very, what I would call campy. They're very camp, um, not entirely serious where uh, in Farley Field was definitely a more uh, serious uh, plot line and um, tone. Really, really liked that. And I've just started another called The Tuscan Child. And um, in Farley Field involves uh, the intrigue around, it's, it's during World War II, uh, Farley is a, um, uh, family estate and a uh, man is found dead in their field and uh, he had apparently died uh, falling when his parachute didn't open and uh, there's suspicion that he uh, was a German spy and so there's um, uh, the mystery behind that and what might he be doing in that field and a very likable characters and great writing style really kept me interested. And then the Tuscan Child is, uh, part of it is set around um, World War II, a man, um, British, uh, Royal, Royal Air Force pilot, um, his plane, he parachutes from his crashing plane uh, into uh, a place in Italy and um, you flash forward to uh, 1973 I believe it is and his daughter's story and the things that she starts learning about her father that she didn't know. So I am also uh, with the little I've read enjoying that book too. And then there's another that's on my list called um, I think it's called The Victory Garden something about Victory Garden. So I'm um, definitely looking forward to uh, reading that too. Here, I'm just going to, I've got my notes here, just my page is about to flip up, so I'm just going to anchor it down with a skein of yarn, because everyone has a skein of yarn close by that they can do that with, right? So I think that just kind of leaves us to what's been going on around here for the past couple of weeks. Uh, so I last recorded, I believe it was December 30th, and we were getting ready to leave the next day to uh, go to Vancouver Island uh, for two purposes. One was to visit some of Cameron's family, and the other purpose was to have a little bit of time off, uh, just the two of us, after uh, what was a busy holiday season. So we did um, spend New Year's Eve with um, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law and 
that afternoon we went to uh, visit my mother-in-law and they had uh, their their place has um, uh, music in the afternoon so we went uh, to that it was a guy with a guitar and um, kind of background vocals and music on a machine and he played all sorts of great stuff like um, Jimmy Buffett, The Eagles, America, um, trying to think what else, but music that I know and like. Uh, most of the songs he played I have on my iPod, uh, so I quite enjoyed that. I said something to my mother-in-law about um, recognizing pretty well every one of the songs and she said yes she did too, but I guarantee she didn't. <laughs> But that's okay. Hopefully she enjoyed that. Um, so then the next morning we headed up island and took our time because uh, we couldn't check in until four o'clock. Uh, oh, I know we went out for breakfast first with um, with my brother-in-law and sister-in-law and then we headed out and finally got into our place. It is a like a, I guess a spa resort right on the uh, water. We had a room that was overlooking the ocean We're on the third floor um, and it was just beautiful. I will show you this series of pictures. I It just was an ever-changing view as the tide came in and went out and as the weather changed we uh, had quite, uh, most of the weather was not very nice. It was either raining, windy. Um, we went up the next day uh, further up island to visit um, Cameron's other brother and his wife and we ran into snow on the way home. So the weather was not great but uh, we did manage to get out for a walk on the Friday I guess it was and even though it was windy it wasn't raining and um, I put together a sort of a video of our highlights of our walk which I will uh, include at the end of this podcast. Uh, we saw um, a seal, we saw eagles, quite a few eagles flying overhead, seagulls of course, little um, seabirds. I, I don't know what they are. I had in my mind what I thought they might be and then I forgot to look it up. So if you happen to recognize what kind of birds you see in the video, let me know. Um, the hotel is located near a provincial park and um, so we walked past that. Uh, there were rabbits in the fields there. Um, I'm, there was at one point where a bird flew overhead, I think an eagle or a hawk, and they very quickly froze or ran to their burrows. So I'm sure that they do provide a meal or two for the birds overhead sometimes. Uh, lots and lots of seashells, a uh, few crab shells, um, and just, of course, the crashing of the waves. I just love that sound. So it was a beautiful, even though it wasn't beautiful out, it was a great walk. And hope you enjoy a little taste of that. Uh, that night, we went to the restaurant there. Most of the cooking we did, or most of the meals we just had um, uh, in our in our room um, because we did bring food with us. We had a full kitchen set up there, uh, but the, we did go out for a special dinner one night and um, Cameron started it. The weather special they had was a whole big uh, bowl of steamed clams and mussels in a garlic sauce, garlic butter sauce. And I had a few, but um, they were amazing and they had fresh bread to dip in the sauce. Oh, it was delicious. And then, um, oh, I had a steak. I hadn't had a steak for a while. Um, so, it seems so long ago, but um, anyway, we had a lovely, lovely dinner. 
nice wine and we were on in a table all kind of off by ourselves had a really great waitress who timed everything really nicely didn't rush us uh, it was a truly lovely lovely dinner and a nice way to kind of end our stay there because we got up next morning and had to go home we decided to come home on the Saturday so that Cameron would have one more day at home before he had to head back to work and we also thought we might avoid some of the um, travel traffic, holiday traffic, as since kids were going back to school the next day too, I think. Um, it just meant, yeah, I guess they went back on the Monday, so it just meant less hassle with traveling. Um, so we contemplated taking down all our Christmas stuff on Sunday contemplated it very briefly and decided that other than getting groceries for the week we weren't doing any other jobs and um, so we had a nice lazy Sunday before we got back into you know real life as I call it um, starting Monday so I don't even think I de-Christmased the house Monday. I think I did it on the Tuesday. Yeah, Monday it was like laundry and just tidying up a bunch of things and like little tasks that hadn't gotten done over the holidays, things like that. And um, briefly considered recording last week and then just decided it really, um, I didn't have a lot to show you and I really wasn't uh, ready for it. So that's why it took so long. Um, trying to see what else. Oh, um, oh, so I, I, that Saturday and then on the Sunday I, um, cooked a couple of dinners in the Instant Pot that we then ate later into the week. So, um, I've had a few comments from you about, uh, having an Instant Pot and loving your Instant Pot and I have to say I'm really enjoying it so far. I did, um, I had had at Jessica's, my daughter's place, this um, chili lime, no, lime cilantro chicken or chicken with lime and cilantro, something like that. Basically throw salsa and black beans and taco seasoning and lime and chicken into the Instant Pot, cook it up, oh and chicken broth, cook it up and add some cilantro at the end and shred the chicken. Um, we had it with um, like Mexican rice and a Southwest style salad. And then I made it again last night. Last night we ate it in wraps, kind of like, I guess, uh, not a fajita, but uh, sort of like an enchilada, only not baked. Um, anyway, it's a great recipe. That one is definitely a keeper. And then I did beef stroganoff the next day, and that turned out really well. Um, I'm gonna, I was using two different recipes and kind of took aspects of each, and I have a little tweaking to do, but um, that is one I definitely would make again. Uh, basically, I've had really good success of trying different things. I tried to bake a cake last weekend and while it turned out really delicious and had a very moist texture, um, A, I didn't spray my cake pan. It was non-stick. I thought I'd be okay. Also, maybe I should have let the cake cool a little longer before I attempted to uh, take the top off it. It was in a um, uh, spring form pan that has a, I have a, one that has a flat bottom and then I have the bottom that's shaped like a bunt cake with the hole in the middle. That's the one I tried and um, there were no nice little curves on the top. It was just kind of a straight mess, but it tasted good. So I think next time definitely I'll spray the pan even though it is nonstick and wait till it cools longer. The only really kind of disastrous experience I've had, and part of it's my fault, is I was intrigued by this idea of pot in pot cooking and that's when you put something on the bottom and then you can put another um, can uh, like a um, container it is a container but another pan on top and cook two different things at once 
So I had seen a YouTube video and also uh, a um, recipe online about um, mashed potatoes and meatloaf. So I thought, how hard can it be? So I put potatoes in the bottom in some chicken broth and then I made a meatloaf, put it in the spring form pan, put it on top, followed directions. And okay, the part that was my fault, the potatoes turned out great as far as they cooked perfectly. But I should have clued in, I put less potatoes than they said because I didn't need enough to feed like six people. And so I started to mash them up with a fork to start with and then realized that I had too much liquid for the amount of potatoes and I tried to drain off some and I did but not enough and I just had like potato soup. It was just not nice. Too thick for soup but not thick enough for a mashed potato. And Cameron was long time coming home so um, later than he thought because of the weather and the traffic subsequent traffic issues with the weather and so he finally came in and I had um, had the meatloaf keeping warm I had put it in the oven briefly to brown the top and then it was just there keeping warm well when I went to cut it it was still really pink inside so it hadn't cooked all the way through in the instant pot and the amount of time I had it in the oven obviously wasn't enough to cook it enough. So I was like, oh, and then because he was late coming home, I had steamed some vegetables and they were mush by the time he got home. So dinner seemed like quite the disaster. Well, what we ended up doing, I put the meatloaf into the oven to finish cooking. And then we cooked some more potatoes. And my idea was first I was going to cook some more potatoes, mix them in with the potatoes I'd already mashed, just to make them thicker. But then we decided why not just mash these potatoes and eat them. We know they'll be fine. And I was just going to chuck the other potatoes. And then we cooked some more vegetables. So dinner actually turned out fine in the end. And then there was a lot of leftovers of the meatloaf and I decided I would make shepherd's pie out of the leftovers. And then I realized I didn't have to throw away the potatoes. I could cook a couple of more, mix them in with the uh, really runny mashed potatoes and that should work out. And it all did. And so we have shepherd's pie uh, in the fridge waiting to be um, cooked up for tonight. So what started out as a disaster, turned out okay in the end. Uh, but I don't think I will do um, meatloaf and mashed potatoes in the Instant Pot again. It just um, just did not have good results and I think it's just as easy to do that one um, the standard way. Um, let me see, so I got back into a good routine this week. I told you I got a Fitbit for Christmas and the first first week I had it I didn't sort of try and and achieve any amount of steps or anything uh, but starting last Monday I started back into watching what I was eating and getting some regular exercise and I have to say it is a motivator to have try and achieve at the minimum your 10,000 steps or I have it set up to where I have um, during the day uh, for every hour to walk 250 steps so I sometimes consciously will achieve that and even though the weather has been really crappy and I haven't been able to go for um, very many of my usual walks sometimes I just walk up and down the hall for 15 minutes at a time or while my tea is steeping four minutes I just walk and I'm finding I'm definitely getting my steps in and um, just feel better about consciously moving more often. Um, we got back to uh, curling last week and we won! Yes! Uh, that doesn't happen very often. If you've been watching for any length of time you know that. So it's always a thrill when we win. In fact the opposition didn't score any points at all. We finished after the fifth end. We have usually a chance to play up to eight. Um, and we had a one 
the woman who was playing third was sparing for our usual third. And she's a very good player, so no doubt that helped us. And she's playing with us again this week, too. So, um, anyway, yeah, it was, it was great to have a victory for a change. Um, talking about this winter weather. So, I think it was last Friday we got our initial snowfall. Oh, yes, because then on Saturday, I spent the day at our older son's place helping him and his girlfriend's mom paint their downstairs. Um, Matt had done some painting before. Stephanie was at work, and they'd asked if we would help. Apparently, we, I offered to help. I don't remember doing that, but I'm sure I did at some point. <laughs> anyway, they took us up on it. And so it's a little place. It uh, didn't take that long, um, and it has needed painting since he moved in well over a year ago. So he, I know he was thrilled to get that get that done, and it was a nice chance to get to know uh, Stephanie's mom a little bit more. We had had dinner with her and her husband um, this past summer, but other than that, I haven't have never had a chance to spend time with her. So that was a good. That actually turned out to be a really good thing. So then I think it was Sunday, yes, Sunday, the snow started to fall in earnest and the winds picked up. And um, so my younger sister and her husband had headed into Coquitlam, which is, oh, probably an hour to an hour and 50 minutes drive from here. And uh, their daughter um, was pregnant and was experiencing, um, had had high blood pressure and was going to go in and, and get checked out. So they went in and picked up their little grandson, he's about two and a half, brought him back out with them to keep in case uh, my niece um, had to be admitted to the hospital or, or anything like that. So I guess there the weather was great they even had some sunshine but um, as they were heading home we were myself and my uh, other sisters that live out here were all communicating with her and telling her what it was like out here because the weather was not good it was snowing like crazy and blowing like crazy and so um, my other sister who lives up the hill like they do they said the traffic going up the hill was really backed up. They eventually made it home, but I had put out the offer that they could come here if necessary, because we're on the flat. Down, I, we, I always call us the Valley Folk Below, and if you remember the um, song One Tin Soldier from way back, probably 70s, that's where that comes from. Uh, so we have all sorts of jokes about the Valley Folk Below and the people on the mountain. So some advantages, or one advantage to living in the valley uh, below is that you don't have to contend with the hills in wintertime. The downside is, is we live on a floodplain and potentially could be flooded up. So balancing act, right? In any case, long story short is uh, my sister uh, they and her husband, they sort of attempted to get up the hill, saw that it was still backed up and that people were having trouble and decided to head over here. And it was just, it worked out great because I had planned to cook a roast in the instant pot for dinner to do beef dip with and I had put bread dough in the um, bread machine to make um, buns out of. And so, um, they came in and it was warm and smelled wonderful and they had a good meal waiting for them. And um, their little grandson is so good. He just played. We've got a bunch of toys here because of our own grandkids and he just played with the toys. He was just so good. And after dinner, uh, they decided to attempt to go home again and that all worked out fine. And then the best news was that their niece, what. Uh, while they were here, they learned that their daughter was uh, going to be scheduled the next day for a C-section. And so she had a little girl. Uh, she had a boy before, now they have a little girl. 
So everyone, of course, is thrilled to uh, welcome a new uh, member into the family. She's really cute, roly-poly, black, black hair, lots of it. I think she's going to be a real cutie. So I should have added, I guess, to my 20 and 20, I need to make a little something for her. Uh, my niece is a knitter, so she definitely appreciates uh, knitted items. In fact, uh, she had texted my sister a picture of her in the hospital waiting to um, go into surgery and she was knitting to um, keep herself occupied. Um, I'm going to take a quick break here again to go uh, change out the hummingbird feeders and I will be right back. As I mentioned earlier, it's very challenging feeding the hummingbirds during periods of extreme cold because the hummingbird feeders freeze up so quickly. Uh, if I put out a fully thawed feeder first thing in the morning, it's pretty well all completely frozen within 45 minutes to an hour. And so what I end up doing during the day is swapping out a partially thawed feeder with a frozen feeder about every half hour or so. I have three feeders plus this little hand feeder which I actually bought sort of on a lark but has proved to come in rather handy the past couple of days. So um, yesterday I actually really perfected my method for swapping out these feeders. I have two that I'm swapping out in the back. They're both traditional ones that kind of hang with a reservoir up top and then the little feeder things at the bottom. And so what I will do is I have a metal thawing tray I bought years ago that helps meat thaw more quickly if you put it out on your counter. And so, it, because it conducts heat. And so what I do is, is I put that in the bottom of my kitchen sink and run very hot water just to the height where I could put the feeder in and the water comes up basically just to the feeding holes because I don't want to dilute the solution with water, have it leak in there. And so I put that in and then while well, it sits in the hot water, it starts to thaw enough so that it becomes partially liquid and then, like I say, in about half an hour, I'll swap it out with the feeder that has since become frozen. And then yesterday, um, I had to put, a, a while ago, I had put a hummingbird feeder out in the front yard. Uh, but it didn't see a lot of action. And when it froze, it was in the middle of the yard and there's lots of snow and I didn't bother doing anything with it. But yesterday morning, I noticed a hummingbird uh, at it a couple times and realized it probably wasn't getting anything out of it and that felt really bad so um, then I happened to notice the hummingbird was taking refuge in my front hedge and um, I could see it tucked in behind this kind of pile of snow and I could see it from my uh, living room window Anyway, so what I end up doing is getting uh, an, another that one of the hummingbird feeders, and I took it out to the front yard, thought you know a, a thawed one, and then I swapped it out with this little thing, and it's a flat feeder. The the liquids in the bottom and the feeding holes are on top, so it thaws much more quickly when I put it in the hot water. So I can put it in the hot water for say ten minutes put this out in the meantime it has access to to food and then I can can swap it out with the um, bigger feeder um, I think it was last year or the year before I got video of myself feeding a hummingbird with this I think it was during my vlogmas and yesterday um, I actually had the hummingbird feed out of this well I was holding it three different times one I managed to get recorded. Uh, it's such a thrill to have literally a hummingbird this far from you and to see it so close up. And actually twice I had it my finger like that and twice the hummingbird actually sat on my gloved finger and uh, 
drank out of this. It was quite something. And I don't see male hummingbirds very often. And this was a beautiful male anise hummingbird with its crimson uh, throat. And um, I got some good pictures and video of it. So at the end of the podcast, I've included a little montage of it and a couple other hummingbirds at the back feeder. And you can see it's not just that it's cold, but it's been windy. And so sometimes sitting on the feeder, it is swinging like this. Or in one shot, you'll see the snow is just coming down and this poor little hummingbird has to brave uh, that, those conditions in order to get to the feeder. So I try and put them as sheltered as I can. Um, I know there are um, heaters for hummingbird feeders. I, I've, I should look into them, at least for one for each, the front and the back. Um, there are other methods, it's just I don't have anywhere nearby to hook up lights and things like that. So um, right now just switching them out is working for me and um, I'll continue to do that as long as I have to. The good news is, is that it is supposed to get warmer in the next day or two and won't be quite as, quite as difficult for the poor little uh, birds to um, get fed. And of course my regular feeders are stocked and are um, have been very uh, very very busy these days as you might imagine with I have seed and suet and they are constantly being visited so that's good. I feel like I'm helping out in my own small way. Uh, let me see what else Oh yeah, speaking of birds, I know whenever I include uh, shots of eagles, I always hear back from quite a few of you. And um, this time of year, we generally see quite a few eagles in our immediate area. Um, there's one tree I call the eagle tree that almost every day, there's at least one eagle that roosts there. We, many times there are uh, multiple eagles there. I think one day there were five or six even. Um, and then there's a willow just over from there that often I'll see an eagle or two perched on the top of that too. Um, so I've taken some video, uh, I guess taken over the past week or so of some eagles. And I've also made a little video of those and uh, will again put that at the end of the podcast if you're interested. Um, one, the, the first two shots you'll see are um, one day, must have been last weekend, and um, we could see that there was some kind of kill because there were, because there were quite a few eagles that kept going back to this one area and uh, kind of competing with each other for the food. And um, so you'll see a little bit of some pecking order going on in the willow tree to begin with. And then you will see in the next shot, um, eagle sitting in the eagle tree and actually eating something, which I never see that ever. So that was kind of cool. And then the final shot, I was coming back from a walk and just about half a block this way, up at the end of my street, um, we sometimes see eagles sitting there and um, sure enough, there were two in one tree. So I got back from my walk and grabbed my camera and walked back up the block and they were still there. So I got some shots for you. Never get tired of seeing them. I hope you don't either. Let me just take a real quick look at my notes here to see if there's anything else. I should touch on, um, no, I think that's it. So we've reached the end of what I think is going to be a really long episode. I want to uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, of course, thanks to all of you who did take the time to reach out over the past couple of weeks. I always appreciate hearing from you. I would love it if you drop by the Ravelry group and feel free to chat about anything you like. Uh, show me what you are up to um, for the coming year or just this month or just this week. <laughs> I always like to see people's projects. So um, I'm hoping to um, resume sort of a regular 
weekly podcast schedule now that the new year has begun and now that life is kind of settled in back to normal. I am going away for a few days on, in a couple of weeks, but it shouldn't interfere with my schedule as far as I know. So um, take care until we meet again and um, I hope to see you soon. Bye.